we come to our time of prayer, I just want to lift up a couple of folks that I would like for you to add to your prayer list. Uh, Kelly Payton has a dear friend, Christy, who will be undergoing some chemo treatments uh, or treatments for cancer at MD Anderson over the next couple of weeks. So please uh, lift her. Uh, Christy, her friend Christy, in prayer for health and healing. And then I want to ask you to please be in prayer for Miriam and Owen Brown. Their uh, daughter Stacy passed away this week unexpectedly, a uh, tragic accident at home. And uh, they went this weekend for the service. It was yesterday. They will be traveling back today. Stacy, their daughter, leaves behind a husband and uh, two younger children, a, a child in college and then a son who is going to be a senior this year in high school. And so we just want to surround that entire family uh, with your love, support, and prayers. So let us now go to the Lord with an, uh, an attitude of grace and thanksgiving. Let us pray. God of grace and glory, you are the God of all people. You are the God who is with us every step of the way. You are with us through our high highs and the joys that abound, and you are there in the low lows and the difficulties of life. And we are so very grateful. Lord, help us to feel your presence in every situation of life. As you called your disciples and then sent them forth out into the world, into the community, so send us forth, Lord. Help us to be those disciples that you want us to be. Reaching out to those in our community, those who are like us and those who are not like us. Those who are in the midst of everything, but those who are also on the fringe of nothing. And Lord, uh, even when we might be rejected, help us to just brush the dust off our sandals. Let us not lose sight of the mission let us keep moving forward. Don't let it derail us, even a slight rejection. But give us the hope and the courage that we need to continue with the mission and the ministry that you call us to. Lord, we come here today in need of something. May we find it. Find it in the songs. Find it in the prayers. Find it in the people who sit with us in the community of faith. Find it in the word. Find it in the quiet. Lord, reach out to each and every one of us. You know what we need better than we know ourselves. Grant us healing where there needs to be healing discernment and wisdom where we question, strength and courage where we are frail. For we know, Lord, that when we lean on you, all things are possible. And with the same courage of expectation, let us pray the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So today we continue our sermon series on suitcase sayings. The saying today is travel light. 
So see if you can hear in the scripture this morning how Jesus wants us to pack our bags. It comes from Mark's gospel, the sixth chapter. I'm going to begin at the seventh verse, and I'm using the NIV, the New International Version. So hear now these words. Calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over impure spirits. And these were the instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. And whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave at that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They went out and preached that people should repent. And they drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and they healed them. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Almighty God, still the busyness of our minds and open our hearts to you that we may hear your word for us this day. Amen. Well, I know you're not going to believe it if you saw the little video that I posted on Facebook. If you're my Facebook friend, if not, I encourage you to become my Facebook friend. But on moving day, three big U-Hauls with all of our worldly possessions pulled out of the driveway in Shreveport and the next day landed here in Alexandria. So you're not going to believe, with that in mind, the next statement is that when uh, Rusty and I travel... We travel pretty light. Now, I know all that, uh, if, you, if you saw our house and all the boxes, 350 of them uh, stacked up everywhere, uh, you would not believe that we are people who travel light. Now, it wasn't always that way, I will tell you. Now, Rusty's always been a good packer, but me, when I would go on a weekend trip, three days, I would need seven pairs of shoes. Uh, now, not so much. Now, if I can't take my two pairs of sandals, I don't need to be going. I am one who now has learned to travel light. Well, that is absolutely the instruction that Jesus gives his disciples this morning in our scripture. He tells them to travel light. So let's take a closer look. Now, if you remember, last week, we left Jesus on the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. And there he was calling his 12 disciples. And he was saying to them, come, come, follow me. I'm going to teach you how to catch people. Well, now today he has absolutely changed that message. And he's saying, go, go, go out there. He's sending out the 12 two by two on their very first missionary journey. A little on-the-job training as he sends them out. And, And he sends them out with authority. And not just any authority. He sends them out with his authority, his authority over evil, his authority to preach, his authority to heal, his authority to cast out impure spirits. Wow. That is a big deal. That's, that's a lot of authority, if you ask me, especially on their first missionary journey. It shows how much confidence that Jesus has in the 12 that he has picked. But then he gives them this instruction. He says, now travel light. And he tells them what to bring and what not to bring. He says, bring a staff and bring one shirt, not an extra shirt. That's all you need. And here's what not to take. No bag, no bread, no money. You see, in Jesus' day, traveling preachers and magicians were all about lining their pockets. 
And so uh, he didn't want his disciples uh, to be confused by the fakers out in the community. He wanted people to know that his guys, these guys, his disciples were the real deal. So he didn't want them uh, taking money from other people for what they were doing, for what they were saying, for the healings that they were offering. He wanted to know, he wanted everyone to know that these guys were genuine and that they came with his authority. And the second instruction was to stay in the first place that offered you hospitality. That he didn't want them going to other homes looking for better food, maybe more luxurious accommodations. Because that was the other thing that the scam artists were doing in Jesus' day. They were looking around and say, oh, well, you have a more comfortable bed. I think I'll stay with you, or you're a much better cook, so they say, so I'm going to come to your house. The, the fakers, the false prophets, were all about uh, getting whatever amenities they could for themselves but not Jesus' disciples. That was not the instruction that they gave. Why? Why travel light? Why these instructions? Why only accept hospitality from the first one that offers it? Well, the why is because it was to be all about the mission. Jesus wanted his disciples to travel light so they could focus on the mission and not on their own personal needs. Jesus wanted them to focus on building relationships and not build up their purse or pocket. Jesus wanted them to be an extension of the gospel and not the center of attention. It's what Jesus wanted for his disciples on that first missionary journey. But it's also the same expectation that Jesus has for his disciples today, for us as well. You know, we can't just sit in here and check off a box and say to ourselves, oh, well, we've, we've done a good thing. Now that's, that's it. I'm going to go home. We are not a country club. We're a church, and we have so much more to offer we can't just come. Coming is important. But we must also go. We must also be willing to go out in the community and to be an extension of the gospel story in the same way that the 12 were in our scripture this morning. Now, I wish I could tell you in all honesty that my response to God's go in my life has always been like A1, but it has not. My very first appointment in the United Methodist Church, I was an associate pastor at a church down in New Orleans, and the, the job among many of the jobs, of, you know, the hats that an associate pastor wears, the senior pastor wanted me to focus my time and attention on evangelism. Now, i got to tell you, I don't even think I could spell the word evangelism, much less do it at that point in my life and ministry. He wanted me to um, call first-time visitors on the phone or drop by, you know, and, and leave a gift and, and that kind of thing. And I got to tell you, that made me so nervous. I was awkward. I was nervous. I was, I, I was hoping that if, that if I knocked on the door, they weren't there. And if I called on the phone, I got an answer machine. I, that, I'm just completely honest with you. Well, at one point in that eight years as I was learning how to do that, God got a hold of me and finally said, uh, Ariel, this is not about you. You know, this is not about what you want or what you need. This is about a community of faith that has something to offer people. And you know, when I finally got that, when I finally understood that, I got real excited. 
And I wanted people to answer the phone, and I wanted people to answer their door, because I wanted to tell them about this great church and what it had to offer. And I wanted them to experience and have the same thing that I had, a place where a village surrounded me and supported me and loved me, a community of faith, and a God that forgave me. I wanted people, strangers, total strangers, friends, loved ones, anybody that would listen to have and know that same exact thing. I got so passionate and so excited about evangelism that I went and enrolled at SMU in Dallas and got a doctorate in evangelism so I could be the best equipped person I possibly could be to help people and churches invite others and let them experience and know the great things that a church has to offer. We're far more than a civic organization. We have something that civic organizations don't have. We have a great God that loves us and forgives us, and everybody needs to know about that. Well, I wish I could tell you in the midst of learning how to not only spell evangelism, but do evangelism, that it was always easy. That everybody that I invited or introduced to the church was a glorious yes. But alas, it was not. And neither was it for the disciples either. I think that's why Jesus told them in verse 11 that, you know, if they don't listen to you, if they reject you, then just dust your feet off and go on out the door to the next one that will. He knew. He knew that his disciples were not always going to be well-received. He wasn't well-received either. I mean, so if you back up a few verses of chapter 6 of Mark, you're going to see that Jesus was in his hometown, in his home church, and they were skeptical. They were saying, isn't that Mary's boy? Isn't that, isn't that his brothers sitting over there in the corner of the church, you know, kind of hiding their faces? Isn't he a carpenter? Who does he think he is? Rolling up here into our church and saying what he's saying and healing people, offering to healing. They were skeptical about who he was and what he could do. In fact, he said to them, only in his hometown among his relatives and his own house is a prophet without honor. So he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. Jesus knew. Jesus knew that some invitations are going to fall on, fall on deaf ears. But he didn't let that derail his work or his mission. I think that's a good lesson for us too. We can't let a little no here and there keep us from doing the mission that we're called to do. So what is our mission? Well, if you look on the front and even the back of your worship bulletin, you're going to see our mission statement. Transforming our community by building relationships to grow active disciples who share the life-changing lessons of Jesus. Well, friends, I got to tell you, we can't do two and three. We can't do grow and share until we're willing to do the first one. Until we're willing to build relationships. Transforming our community by building relationships. So what is your community? What is our community? Well, you're going to hear me remind you each and every Sunday as we walk out the door that our community, our world... Is where you work, play, and live. Where you work, where you play, and where you live. That is your circle. And friends, it is within those circles where you work, play, and live that I want to encourage you to build relationships. 
Because with that fancy degree, that's when I got these stripes on my arm, doctor. That's why they call me doctor. Let me tell you what I learned. <laughs> all, all that time and all that money. Let me, let me tell you the one most important thing. A, a website is important. Social media is important. All those things are important. But you know what the most important thing is? Do you know the number one way that people, even today, in 2021, post-COVID, do you know the way that people still come into a community of faith is on the elbow of someone else because you have invited them to join you. Someone in your circle where you work, play, or live has been invited by you. You know, one of the best gifts that you can give somebody is what you have right here. Something you already know is a village of people that will pray for you, love you, support you, bring you a casserole when you need it. Wouldn't you want that for someone else in your life? Someone where you work, play, or live? Wouldn't you want them to have that same thing? So we cannot grow active disciples who share the life-changing lessons of Jesus until we're willing to build relationships with people where we work, where we play, and where we live. So it's not rocket surgery. It's simple. You know, Jesus said, travel light. Take no bag, no money, no belt. So, with that same idea in mind, I just want to tell you, you don't have to know all the doctrines of the United Methodist Church. You don't have to know any, you don't have to be a great Bible scholar to invite someone. You don't even have to know the the church calendar or the phone number or anything like that. You don't have to know any of that. When Jesus says, travel light, keep it simple, that's what he's saying. That's what he's encouraging us to do, to just keep it simple, to travel light and invite, invite, invite. I'm in and I'm in. Let us pray. Almighty God, open our eyes. To the people in our circle where we work, where we play, and where we live. To those in need of the good news of a great God. And then give us voice, give us courage. To step out there and say, hey, friend, come with me. Let me show you a community that will love you and accept you no matter what. Lord, this is our prayer that we can be like those first disciples to do that same work that you call us to do. In your name we pray. Amen.